thank you, Jam. It's it's been a really wonderful journey for me, and it's taken me to a new place that um, you know feels like home already. Oh, that's cheesy, but um, but from the heart, you know, I I I really like where I've landed. So uh, thank you, Typo Three. Welcome to Application, the Typo Three Community Podcast. Hi, I'm Felicity Brand, and this is Application, the Typo3 community podcast, sharing your stories, your projects, and the difference you make. (laughs) Hi, I'm Felicity Brand, and this is Application, the Typo3 community podcast, the podcast that Shamsi was too scared to come on. One, two. Welcome to Application, the Typo3 Community Podcast. I'm Jeffrey A. McGuire. You can call me Jam. And this is where we celebrate the Typo3 community, sharing your stories, talking about your projects and the difference you make in, around, and with Typo3 CMS. In today's episode of Application, the Typo3 Community Podcast, I speak with Felicity Brand, a fellow team member at Open Strategy Partners and author of the Typo3 Guidebook, which we have been putting together for the last couple of years here at Open Strategy Partners. I talk with Felicity about her background, how she and I both agree on the fact that technical writing is a structured creative process, how welcoming open source and the Typo3 community in particular are, and I was really gratified to hear how inspired she is by her experiences. Typo3 and doing this book represent her first open source experiences at all. And she's a total believer now. And it's really, really interesting. And I think um, I think that she's got the potential to make a huge difference in the world. And, and I'm really super grateful. And you'll hear this in this episode for all the chances that we have to make a difference with open source software and, and the people doing it. So I... Sincerely hope that you enjoyed this episode as much as I enjoyed making it. And in fact, we are recording a podcast, and this is, um, as they say in television, a very special episode of the Typo3 uh, community podcast that we call Application. Now, Part of what's special about this is that Felicity has spent more than the last year on a project for and with the Typo3 community, creating the Typo3 book. And that's coming out from A Press either December 2020 or January 2021. And Felicity has put in an enormous amount of work in that and spent an enormous amount of time working with the wonderful community contributors. I was also involved with that project. I'd really, really like to get into that today. We're also going to talk about who Felicity is and what she does. And it's important that I say at this point, the Typo3 Association kindly sponsors this podcast and they also sponsored the book project. So the company that Felicity and I work for called Open Strategy Partners was working for slash with the Typo3 Association for both of the projects that were living live today. So. If that counts as a paid message or a whatever, I think we've kept the lawyers happy, I hope. But the exciting thing for me about the book was we were given this opportunity to help a community that we are deeply involved in and we like a lot and we have a lot of clients in that space. But it really felt like a community effort. In the end, I felt like we were given the chance, the way we solved the problem in the end was we channeled a ton of community members input into a hopefully sensible usable order. How was that experience for you? I would say it was quite smooth. I've never written a book before and it felt like a really interesting project to get into. I should say that the the project had kind of um, been up and running before I came on board. So there was already interviews recorded with community members and the bare bones and structure of the book existed. I would say because Open Strategy Partners has a great process of uh, using briefs to 
make sure the message is agreed before you start writing. It was actually quite a smooth process for me to come in new and look at this task I was given. And I think our colleague Heather likes to talk about eating the elephant. You eat it one bite at a time. And that's kind of how we went along. So I actually started with chapter four and kind of worked from there. Um, we went, and then I went to chapter two, chapter, and then we looked at the guides and it, it, um, it gradually came together. Talk just a little bit more about the interface between a bunch of information that had been collected before you came onto the project and this, the structure, the structural ideas that we use to help us. Yeah, yeah. So, I yeah, I I didn't get into that. So so we had some interviews that had been recorded, and we had um, used a tool to transcribe them. So I could read that. I could then reach out to the person who had been interviewed and ask for the questions or dig deeper, or I could just use great content that already given us um, to f to kind of plug into the brief or the structure that we had used to create a skeleton for chapters and the sections we wanted in those chapters. So I took a whole interview and cherry picked really great um, bite sized pieces, you know, that fit into particular sections of the book or that supported particular points. Um, I really didn't have to work very hard to to create the content that was in the book. Um, I think the people that we interviewed, you know, obviously I think it's quite well known that the community of Typo3 are really passionate about Typo3. So people are happy to talk about the product, they're happy to explain it, and they explained it very well. So uh, yeah, my job, the job of writing the book was, was not difficult in that respect. I eventually summed it up in my own mind saying that we were, we were channeling channeling the community's work. And interestingly, especially at the sort of top end of the web where I have more experience, so in CMSs and in public facing projects, I find a lot of people willing to help and a lot of people, it's like a when you go to an open source event, when you participate, it's like the best show and tell ever because you have someone who's like, I was trying to, I figured out how to fix this thing and the, my first instinct is to come and tell all of my friends about it. And it's just, an, um, it's an amazing energy, right? And I think we, I think we captured some of that in the book project. You were given this raw information that we had uh, collected and then for each chapter, we had set up a, 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 a kind of a skeleton uh, inside of a larger skeleton of the book. So each chapter and each guide, the, the templates were different, but essentially there was a sort of a learning goal and uh, points that we had to hit through it and 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 what we had to link to and sort of conclusions and, and, and further reading. And so you said that helped you. Um, imagine you hadn't had that structure. How would you have approached this? I would have spent time putting that structure in place. So um, when I learnt technical writing, you know, I was taught you should spend 10% of your time planning. Before you even put pen to paper, you need to have your plan. So if I did not have that plan, I would have <laughs> spent my time getting a good plan in place. I would have had that reviewed and signed off before embarking upon um, pulling content together, particularly with a book which is so large, yeah, you really need to know where you're going. And yeah, without a plan, you're lost, really. You would just be riding in circles and um, it never would have been finished, I think. So oh, that's really interesting. So, so I, I, I wonder if coming to OSP, um, the way that we, we have, we call it the authentic communication framework, but um, I feel like we spent 30 or 40 or 50% of our time planning um, because we want to make content that is that is useful on on multiple levels, like strategically relevant, pointing people in the right direction, helping people figure out if they need something or not all that stuff. So asking about your your background in technical writing, how did it feel to discover that that we were we were working that way? was that a was that a good sign for you when you were coming in? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yes. I think when you are a lone writer, it's very tempting to write 
without a plan because often you're under time constraints or you are feeling confident you, that you, you know just what say, oh, you I'll just get this done. I'll just get this I'll done. I'll just bash it out. And, yeah. and I think that's really tempting and risky. So for many reasons, the, the briefs and the templates and the, the processes that we use at OSP are, are just so helpful and they keep you on track you know you're going in the right direction because you know that direction has been signed off by the client. You can feel confident when you're writing that you're you're working within these boundaries that are taking you to a place where you're going to add value. Yeah, it's, um, right. it's great. That, that's a confidence builder, I, I guess. Yeah. I hope. I mean, I feel that way. Tell me a little bit more about your background. I believe you did some business uh, analysis. The things that I remember right now about your background, it's been a while since we talked about this stuff. You did business analysis and technical writing and coming to OSP and basically coming straight to this book project, you had not encountered open source before. You, you had no direct experience. I mean, maybe you'd run Linux or used WordPress or what have you, but um, but that was new. So I think part one of this question is, tell us about your background and, and how you ended up as, as the writer you are today. Okay, so I studied English at university, including linguistics. So it's pretty hard to get a job in that kind of area straight out of uni. Um, and I went into an energy retailer and I was working with the software and I kind of fell into being a business analyst because. Wait, wait. Do you remember? Do you remember the Fast Show? Did you ever see the Fast Show? The Fast Show was an English um, sketch comedy thing, and they had a. Um, when you said I work for an energy re retailer, I had this this vision. They have this um, sketch that comes back, and it's a it's a gentleman's. It's a bespoke, um, you know, tailoring. Uh, they sell menswear, right? But the joke is that they're always making really, like waggling their eyebrows, making really innuendo uh, loaded co comments. And then their catchphrase is always like, suits you, sir, suits you, sir. Lovely trouser, suits you, sir. <laughs> and I was just picturing you, um, can we interest you in some solo? We've got some hydro in the mix, suits you, sir. Like, is that how energy retailing works? <laughs> Not in my experience, no. <laughs> Lovely solar panels, madam. Lovely. Oh my dear, no, that's um. Okay. Yeah, that's yeah. I might have to catch up on that show. Yeah. Um, I apologize for interrupting. Uh, that's all right. <laughs> so you got into energy retailing. Um, a, an obvious choice for a linguistics major. So a lot of that work was dealing with numbers and spreadsheets because we're looking at usage, kilowatt hour usage. Um, so my transferable skills from university were analysis. Uh -huh. you're, you're either parsing a sentence for the linguistic terms or you are looking at kilowatt hour usage over a day and looking at peak and off peak. Uh, yeah. So, wow. uh, so I was um, in that company supporting the people that used our software, analysis software. And I was good at talking to the business users and talking to the IT team. So then what that kind of boils down to is um, a kind of translation of business speak and technical speak. A lot of the role requirements were writing documents technical specifications, user test plans, business requirements. So I did that for 10 years. I was quite good at it, but eventually I realised I liked doing all the writing. So I went back to university. I did a postgraduate course in technical communication. And then I have been a writer ever since. So um, that's so fascinating because, I mean, it almost, I was going to make a joke that, um, I want to do an audience poll like, okay, hands up how many how many people found that their linguistic skill set was useful for business analysis because that is just super <laughs> non-obvious to me. I, I just got this um, sort of shiver down my spine because essentially what you were describing is partly my career path and 
partly precisely exactly the reason why we have our company where you and I work, right? Open Strategy Partners, we tell people, and what we do is translate between technical complexity and the value, usually the business value, that someone can get out of a technology solution. So explain it to a developer using the right language and how it makes their day better. Explain it to a marketer and how it makes the business better and so on. So you were, you were doing that along the way. That's, that's fantastic. I think I'm quite good at boiling something down um, to the basics. I'm a great procedural writer. Uh, mm. And I, if I buy anything new, I will open the box and read the manual. And I'm often disappointed. I've, I've thought of something that I wish I said 20 minutes ago. Felicity, what is it that you <laughs> wish you said 20 minutes ago? We were talking about creative writing. You said something about creative writing and what I wanted to explain was there is creativity in technical writing and something that I really enjoy is finding the right word in a sentence to convey what you're trying to say, to convey the meaning in, in a really succinct elegant way yeah. so you know i i think of what i do as a craft and and i really love all the creativity around that so um although it's called technical writing um i that, that is neither, consider myself, neither yeah i consider myself a creative person <laughs> right and and technical writing is neither dry nor dull um that's right and i yeah. love I love at the next level up. I love, for example, cutting out the extraneous so that so that we're also telling a story in a really compact, consumable way, right? Yeah. Like how many times do we talk about, should this be a list of bullet points or a paragraph, right? That sort of thing is really, really exciting. And the structural aspect of the kind of communication that we do to motivate, to inspire, to inform. I, I, um, I, I really love that. And I think we have a, um, it, it's certainly a creative process um, on some levels, and it certainly relies on instinct and, and, and experience um, within those boundaries. So, you know, we say, oh, it's not creative, but you're pointing out that we're we're being a little bit disingenuous about that maybe i think i'm quite good at boiling something down um to the basics i'm a great procedural writer uh, mm. and i if i buy anything new i will open the box and read the manual and i'm often disappointed <laughs> Anyway, um, but I've I've had a um, as you as you mentioned earlier. Last year, I I discovered open source, and um, where has it been all my life? I think oh. I am. I think it's. I think I'm absolutely um, where I want to be because, and I'll tell you why, Jam, because it gives you the opportunity to work with people anywhere in the world, so completely distributed, right? And they are experts at what they do. If, if you're in private enterprise, you're kind of limited to the experts who are in your company. And you're lucky if you get access to talk to them because it may not be in your job description to talk to them. So it, it breaks down barriers um, I've been able to talk with senior technical writers in the project I'm working on called the Good Docs Project from Google and other companies who, they're just high caliber writers and I get to talk with them weekly, you know, and hear what they have to say and learn from them and I just love that. Um, and they get to talk to you, don't forget. Well, that's, that's true, yes. 
Yes. I, I consider you I consider you in completely worthy company there, by the way. <laughs> At OSP, it looks like we made a, a welcoming nest for you because we focus very much on structure and procedure. And because the communication we do is not about creativity per se, it's about telling the right people the right things the way that will resonate with them, right? And it takes a lot of finesse and a lot of thinking and and and, and what have you, but it's um it's it's a set of processes and we help each other and we work with that. Most of us come from an open source background and as a communications agency, we have an amazing chance to help open source companies and organizations with strategic communication who've never had that before, right? And a piece of all of that is bringing you in, you meet the Typo3 community, <laughs> you're given you know, a couple of terabytes of recordings and notes, and it's like, okay, um, here you go, here's a world you didn't know about. Talk about meeting the Typo3 community and um, what you learned. I was surprised by how approachable and friendly and helpful everyone was. And that's all a reflection on me and where I was coming from, which is, um, I suppose, private enterprise. So talking to stakeholders uh, traditionally can be difficult. And there's a lot of education that goes into dealing with difficult stakeholders. And so, you know, I had to speak with a lot of people from the community cold calling basically, you know, hi, I'm Felicity, I'm working on the book. <laughs> can you can you please help me with A, B and C? And yes, yes there is a book. Um, yes, no, really. <laughs> that's right, yeah. Um, and to a T, everybody helped me. Everybody responded. I was just blown away by I it it was nothing but a positive experience and it just showed to me, the the passion that people have for Typo three, it it just really engenders positivity and um, yeah. Surely there and must be um, surely someone out there is a bit cranky. Um, I don't know. Everyone just seems very. I guarantee. You. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but see, I never understood why it took me a couple of. It took. It felt like months. Um, but it took quite a while for me to push you to actually contacting <laughs> Michael Shams um, in, who lives in <laughs> Melbourne and who's one of the world type of three experts and you wouldn't call him. <laughs> and I said, hey, did you, uh, did you set up, did you call, did you talk? And, and it took, it felt like ages, but see, now I understand you were just, you were working your way in there and you, you hadn't, you hadn't, um, you hadn't found your sea legs yet in, in the community. Yeah, I think that would be fair to say. I also feel like I got a bit of a fast track to the top in terms of speaking to some of the major players in the project, or maybe there isn't that sort of um, hierarchy. Um, but yeah, certainly I felt like I was talking with some of the big names um, pretty quickly. So, um, and and they had nothing but time for me. So yeah, it's um, it's great that yeah. That <laughs> um, I mean, open source practitioners generally believe very much in transparency. And I think the majority of people understand that to make the project sustainable, to make any project sustainable, one needs others doing it, contributing their ideas, helping fix it, just using it, telling their friends about it. I mean, there's so many ways. So the the culture of sharing what we do with other people, I think it's, um, um, enlightened self-interest because if we enjoy doing what we're doing, then we need to have it tomorrow and next year and five years from now too. The type of three community is in an interesting and important position in open source in 2020. Uh, uh, so many communities have um, nonprofits and associations and membership structures to help their governance and sustainability. Mm. Type of threes is one of the very few that does not rely on events as their main fundraising source. Type of three has focused on very strongly on a membership model, and then very strongly on investing that money straight back into the community and straight back into the technology. So in Typo3 land, if you're in Europe, for example, it's 
and you want to participate in a in a core contribution sprint or in a community marketing sprint, it's very possible that you will get some or all of your travel costs sponsored to be there, which is not the the, the usual oh. practice in a lot of communities, right? Um, oh, and yeah. so there's the so there's 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 financing in place, and it's as far as I can tell, very well invested into projects like creating a book to help market the project and get the word out that this project is is really worth having a look at. And in 2020, they have their budget and their membership money in place, and all of a sudden nobody can travel. And so the travel costs are sitting on the account, and uh, uh, Benny Mac, the project lead, the Typo3 project lead and lead core developer, had a look around and saw a couple of projects that are struggling a little more than Typo3. And there are so many of these ecosystems that rely on each other and depend on each other. And Benny organized that Typo3 is officially donating money to uh, Symphony, which is a framework that a lot of projects base, are based on, and to the Composer Packagist dependency management infrastructure that mm. um, is also incredibly widespread in PHP. Typo3 in the past donated to the Legal Defense Fund for the Joomla project when the German government was trying to take away their association's nonprofit status. So Typo3 has this really wonderful history of helping and contributing with other projects as well. It's um, I re it's a uh, it's such a it's so heartwarming is a silly word, but it's in, I find it very encouraging to to see that a project that's doing well, they're practically their first thought is, okay, who else needs help? I love that. Lots of people in open source take lots of different to, ways to, to help others as well, whether, you know, like making websites for disaster relief or donating money or whatever. So, so that, that spirit of helping is definitely present. It's really, it's really cool. Yeah, I really like that. After finishing the book, I felt like I wanted to continue to contribute to the community. I, I, I'm, I'm this name that no one's heard of. And it just so happens that my name out of many people that helped write the book happens to be, I think, the first on the cover. Um, and so I was looking for ways to contribute to the community and I, um, I looked around for where I might be able to add value and I, and I had used the docs a lot, the Typo3 documentation I had referred to that a lot when writing the book. So I reached out to the team and I am trying to get involved there now. So I'm working on um, the editor's guide and I'm trying to review some PRs. I've been to some meetings. Wow. Um, so yeah, you I- have, and You have completely fallen for it. <laughs> I have, yeah, I'm, yes, drinking the Kool-Aid. I don't know if uh, we're allowed to use that expression, but um, yeah, I, and it's, and it's so fun. It's, I just, you're working with people who are as enthusiastic as you about what you're working on. Uh, yeah, I really now, like that. Now, here's a funny thought, and you're not the first person to, that I know who's who's had the similar experience, but <laughs> essentially you've you've turned your job into a hobby, right? <laughs> I think so. Yeah. You, know, you, yeah. you hung out with these people for work and, <laughs> and you can't get enough. <laughs> let's shift gears a tiny bit and let's talk about this book. Several years ago, Open Strategy Partners was approached as part of our client work with the Typo3 company, Typo3 GmbH that there was this um, potential gap in in the Typo3 ecosystem. There hadn't been a book in English for a long time. The Typo3 project has gone through a lot in the last 10, 15 years and had a fork, had some uh, interesting experiences that led to Typo3 5 not existing, pulled themselves together, created the company, created really professionalized development and release structures, and is highly standardized, tons, it follows more PSR standards than most projects, uses Symphony components and so on. And it's very professionalized and not enough people have heard about it. And I would like more people to use it because I think it's the right content management system for a number of really useful use cases. And I think it offers a lot of people the chance to have a, commu a community, a career, 
add that to their agency palette, start a business and so on. And I just, I want people to hear about it. So I got really excited about this project. We, um, we've been working on it. We worked on it for a long time. We had several false, false starts. It was a, a series of learning experiences for us. Now we're about to have this, this uh, physical book and ebook that we can distribute, sell, promote. And, and I'm really, really hoping that it opens up makes Typo 3 available to more people around the world than, than it's been for a long time. I'm pretty excited about that. And there seem to be a lot of things pointing in this direction too. There's a fantastic mentor, mentoring mentorship program going on in Typo 3 that I wanna um, bring those people on the podcast soon. There are some users scattered all around the world. There's some governments in Africa using it. There's quite a presence in Eastern Europe. So I think there's a great shot at this. Introduce us to the concept of the book and and then the structure that follows from that. The concept of the book is it's presented in two parts. We have four chapters which introduce the Typo 3 CMS and we um, structured it logically around kind of an overview of the features. We talk about the, I suppose, the editing and the design aspects we talk about configuring and administering and then maintaining and upgrading. So that's kind of our logical grouping in terms of um, explaining what the CMS can do and why its features are so powerful and how it's great. The second part is a series of practical guides um, we wanted to include that in the book. There are a lot of learning resources online, uh, but we thought it was important to include in the book as to help the reader to install, create an extension, translate. We have a great guide in there about building a business around selling Typo3. We included one on common troubleshooting. So the book is, um, the complete package and I and like you I also really hope it um, achieves its goals and and opens up new markets for typo 3 um, I can only speak about my experience here in Australia and um, I can guarantee you if you google it here in Australia you don't get many hits um, so even in terms of looking at meetups um, any kind of local user groups uh, yeah, we, we just, we need to, I think there's a market here and, and we need to tap into that and hopefully the book will help us open those doors. So apart from your grand U PHP user group tour around the metropoles of Australia, how do we, how do we grow Typo3 in Australia? I'm a technical writer, Jam. I'm not a salesperson. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it could be... But You're I think have, it's something of your name's on that thing now. <laughs> I know. So I think um, Shamsi and me, um, Michael Shams and I, need to probably get together and um, start. <laughs> so <laughs> Maybe gone, we need to. You've gone from, from being too intimidated to call him to Shamsi. <laughs> nice. Um. Yeah, I. I imagine we might need to get together and perhaps attend some. CMS user groups, some maybe we need to host some gatherings um, Imagine and build, build it from there, grassroots, you know? In real time, we're talking in late November 2020. Imagine if people could get together. Uh, <sighs> yeah, it's, it's a strange concept indeed. <laughs> yeah. um, one more thing on the, on the book structure the way that it's put together, the first four chapters are a broad overview from a number of perspectives. And in the first part of the book, we were trying to give valuable information for a marketer or a designer or a business person or a developer or a student, um, even maybe someone who just needs a website and would be an, a so-called end user. We tried to give a, a really useful overview that would give it people enough information to find out more or find a service provider or 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 decide to invest their time in um in trying it out and then the second part of the book is 10 10 guides 10 guides that um go into detail and it's um the book is for 
junior developers, for learners, for starting from scratch. Um, there's valuable technical instructions about, you know, use this template this way. But there are, as you say, also sort of tutorials or, or sets of information that are useful for some other things. And I, I love the uh, contribution that we got from Matthias Boltlesniak, where he said, you need a tutorial about setting up a business with this, because it's an open source perspective. And, and let's give that to people, too. So he and Robert Lind from the Type 3 community put a really interesting guide together. And I, I don't know another book that has one of those. And I, I hope it's appropriate. I hope it has its place. But I really like that we tried that out. And the troubleshooting one I mentioned is really interesting to me because it's it's also about the patterns and how to start thinking about that sort of thing. So I'm really hoping the book's a gateway to um, to to for a lot of people to discover a a bunch of things that start with typo three, but I think there's a lot more behind it somehow. Um, so some quick questions for you: Why should people not use typo three? You shouldn't use Typo3 if you just want to write a blog. You can use WordPress. Um, you shouldn't use Typo3 if your needs are small. I think, I think Typo3 shines as an enterprise CMS. Um, so not, it, it's not the answer to everything. And I think that... Um, Many people in the community are happy to tell you that. Define enterprise CMS in this context. <sighs> so I guess I'm thinking of scale. If you have a global company and you're interested in an international kind of setup, you may have multiple sites, you may have multiple languages, you may have multiple products, you may be a large university with many campuses. I think it comes down to large scale web applications that handle a lot of information. And I think that Typo3 shines because it's very structured. So apart from the book, the typo three guide uh, the typo three guidebook from a press where would you direct a totally new typo three user to start learning oh good question i would say the first thing they should do is join the slack team uh join slack and you need to have a typo three account to join slack and you do that very easily from typo3.org website and then I would read the Typo3 documentation. But, you know, I am a technical writer who likes reading the manual. So that's what I would do. Um, uh, apart from the official docs, you could try um, use typo3.com. Use typo3.com is, is a fantastic resource. Um, absolutely exactly right. The person who writes this is Daniel Goetz, and he's one of those developers who does a thing and then blogs about it. And there, there's, there's a whole category of people who, it, this was common also 10 or 15 years ago, people would have blogs just as their personal library of, of things that they wanted to remember. Daniel's a, a leading a Type 3 developer and, and, and works on the core. And full disclosure, he works for a company called B13, which uh, also works with Open Strategy Partners. So, well, yeah, so I, I, I was going to mention B13's blog. They, um, they obviously blog about Typo3 CMS. There is another one, typo3works.eu, works with an X. Tell me as a tech writer who's deeply embedded in the Typo3 community, who do you follow for advice or perspective? Who do you reach out to when you have a question? That's a good question. I suffer the tyranny of asynchronicity because because I'm working in um, an Australian time zone. 
a lot of the people who can help me are asleep when I'm awake. So um, poor old Michael Shams has been <laughs> my go-to guy pretty frequently and he's very responsive. Um, but apart from that, you know, I would reach out to people who feel like um, would answer my questions. So Matthias Bortlesniak or sometimes I go direct to Benny Mac only because um, – Hey, you know, I feel buddy, bad about buddy. doing. I feel bad about it, but he's you know, very I, helpful. You know, he's very I feel helpful. like we've got a connection, and but, yeah, he's he's my book buddy. Um, well, there you go. That's <laughs> awesome. Um, speaking, um, of, you know, speaking of coming in at the top, right? Um, also, I, I thought I think that the tyranny of asynchronicity would be absolutely spectacular <laughs> title for this episode. I want to propose, however, that given the luxury of having asynchronous communication channels open to us that you can put in a question for somebody in Slack and then have a conversation over, I guess it might take longer, but you can still do that. I would also suggest um, everyone I know who knows him says that Danya Zipman is one of the single most helpful people in the entire world. And he, he, also, is he also contributed to the book. Yes, indeed he did. And he is very active in the random channel, which, you know, I mute. The the Typo3 Slack random channel where anyone and everyone can post their random problem that they that they need to overcome. And I just I take my hat off to anyone in the community who was watching that channel and helping people because I, I would just be overwhelmed. Um, mm. So, um, yeah, kudos to those people helping out there. Um, so I, I yeah. want to do two more things for this episode, and then we'll bring you back on for another one later. How about that? I Great. think that um, I would like you to play our little game that we call Suggest a Guest. Who is it that we should have on the podcast? Who do you think? is super interesting for us to bring on and get to know better. Susie Moog. Awesome. Core contributor. Um, Fantastic person. Uh, Zibila. Sibyl. Um, Sibyla Peters. Uh, we just spoke with her. Um, oh, in great. Real time, in real time, we yeah. recorded a conversation with her three, four days ago, and it was super fun. So good guess. Um, I do have another person, but I can't, I cannot. <laughs> no. For those of you, for those of you listening to the Tom, audio. Tom yeah. Warwick, his name is Tom Warwick. He's in Great Britain and he likes that... to document about templates. Oh, okay, he's on the documentation team. And yeah, War yeah. Warwick is spelt with two W's, is that correct? Yes, yes. Okay, so Tom Warwick, that's a great suggestion, and he wasn't on my list yet. So that I am happy to pursue that. That seems like a great idea. Thank you, Jam. It's, it's been a really wonderful journey for me, and it's taken me to a new place that, um, you know, feels like home already. Oh, that's cheesy, but... Um, but from the heart, you know, I, I, I really like where I've landed. So uh, thank you, Typo3. Really great. And um, I do think this is a fun journey. And stick around. Let's, let's figure out what's next. All right. Till the next time I trick you into coming on the podcast. <laughs> Thanks, Felicity. Um, I believe it's um, getting close to bedtime over there. And... Uh, for me, it's meeting time because it's meeting time all the time. <laughs> <laughs> all righty. Thank you. Thanks, Jan. Bye-bye. Thanks to the Typo3 Association for sponsoring this podcast. Thank you, B13 and Stephanie Kreutzer for our logo. Merci beaucoup, Patrick Gaumont, Typo3 developer and musician extraordinaire for our theme music. Thanks again to today's guest, if you liked what you heard, don't forget to subscribe in the podcast app of your choice and share Application, the Typo3 Community Podcast, with your friends and colleagues. If you didn't like it, please share it with your enemies. 
Would you like to play along and suggest a guest for the podcast? Do you have questions or comments? Reach out to us on Twitter at Typo3Podcast. You can find show notes, links, and more information in our posts on Typo3.org. Remember, open source software would not be what it is without you. Thank you all for your contributions. Well, so like, how do you want me to, what do you want me to change? If you're doing the video, let's, let's fix it, right? Um, you need to move about 15, 10 centimeters to, yep, like that. Yeah, no, okay. Oh. The other, yep, yeah, stop. <laughs> Repaint your room and then we're good to go. <laughs> yeah, background. I've got this door over here. That's no good. Um, People are very yeah. understanding about, you know, in 2020, people understand if you have doors in your house for the city. Uh, <sighs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so,